Hello everyone, I'm Tara Morris from Louisiana Grazing Lands Conservation Initiative and we're here with Bob Blanchette from Abbeville as well as David LeMay from the Ruston and Minden area and Rickson Simmons from Clinton, Mississippi all to talk about their three different watering systems, what they do and uh, kind of a comparison and contrast of what works for them, what doesn't work for them and some technical um, aspects of what they're doing and how they're doing it as well. Um, Bob Blanchett is a grass-fed beef, produ beef producer and retailer in Abbeville with Brookshire Farm. Raise your hand, Bob, say hi. Hey. <laughs> Bob farms primarily on owned land and uses management intensive grazing to graze about 150 beef cattle animals of different classes with, I believe, one trough moved regularly. Am I wrong on that, Bob? Yeah, that's correct. David, raise your hand. David LeMay is in the Minden area and farms mostly on lease land. David also works for <coughs> as a soil conservationist. Um, and he's in the process of adding more stationary troughs to his operation. Rickson Hicks, uh, Rickson Simmons is from Simmons Ventures LLC. He's grazing 215 acres in Clinton, Mississippi, which is near Jackson, Mississippi, with his oldest son, Jess. And they've developed um, an over the levee movable pond sourced watering station. <clears throat> and so I'm gonna give you guys each a time. We're gonna start with uh, David. So kind of tell us about your, your farming operation, what you're doing um and all that so we're going to go through each three of these guys and talk about what their operation looks like and what their watering system looks like but first of all uh let's let's discuss what what's the importance of water systems why aren't we just why aren't you guys just letting your cows drink out of a pond okay you want me to go first tara sure i uh I mainly see a lot more better heifer development. So we do a lot of replacement heifers on our place and uh, also steer weight gains. So when you have the heifers on ponds and, and same with you growing animals on a pond, I, I've just seen, uh, there's research out there also, but I've seen greater steer gains and greater heifer development coming out of that yearling stage on fresh, clean, consistent, water uh especially when it gets hot and it gets dry in north louisiana so i've seen a lot of what better gains um the cows will come out of a pond all day they'll walk right out of the pond where they're uh where they're you know dropping a lot of manure in the ponds they'll walk out of the ponds walk all the way across the pasture for a trough um so and a lot of the nrcs they want to see the animals out of the ponds they don't even want to see animals using ponds. So in a lot of the specs, a lot of the NRCS specs, they'll fence out a pond for you, or, you know, in, as a practice, just to keep the animals out of the surface water. So mm -hmm. it's just contaminating surface water downstream. So as far as the NRCS hat, they want to see ponds not used by cattle. If you if there's another option out there, they want to see the cattle not urine and manure in the water, surface water system. So uh, as far as my personally, weight gains, heifer development, cow, uh, I don't know if it's endocrine system exactly, but they seem like they just do a lot better, uh, even just, just walking out of the ponds and having a trough somewhere on site uh, for clean water. So, uh, and then the NRCS is water quality issues. So it's, it's actual resource concern, water quality and sediments and transported to surface water. So. That's my kind of take on on that real quick. So, Bob, what are your thoughts? Uh, I'm not, I mean, I don't have any ponds, so I, I can't really speak on, but I've seen, I mean, I've seen Ooh. different systems where ponds can be utilized well, where as long as like David's saying, the cows are not actively in the ponds because then it creates water quality issues. Uh, you know, I believe too that water quality uh, supports better nutrition and uh, less parasite load, things like that. And uh, so I'm not saying that pond water is bad, but, but I agree with David that you don't want your cows in the pond because you'll get better performance with a clean water source. Mm -hmm. 
Rickson, do you have anything on uh, that? Yeah, I would agree. That's my only source of water. But the first thing I learned was keep your cows out of the pond, and I wasn't smart enough to argue. So that's the first thing we did. So I would agree. Yeah. Um, and, and being a producer myself, I've seen the same thing. We have leases with all three different types of watering systems and a couple of them are pond only and we really don't see the growth like we do on the other places that have fresh water available. We have a solid comparison between those. Um, so let's start with David. David, tell us about your <clears throat> operation, what you're growing, what you're doing. And okay. tell us, you know, your ins and outs of your water system. Okay. Uh, I, it's It's been a cow-calf operation for, I guess, probably eight years or so. Um, just started with a group of heifers and then eventually bought out several operations and kind of got started there. Then uh, probably four years ago, bought out a big operation that I was working for, a bigger ranch. So just started out with some cows I knew and then just kind of grew and then neighbors places come up and I would lease places and kind of grew into where I had kind of a pathway across Webster Claiborne Parish and just lease properties so up to probably right around that 900 to 1000 acres just lease places didn't have any family land um, not a hundred year old place or nothing like that so just uh, started with cow calf operation raising good calves selling them Oklahoma Apache and places like that and then now we're We've moved into the last four years since 2019 selling beef. Uh, and then that just exploded in 2020. Um, just raising quality, quality steers. Quality, well, we're we're butchering heifers and steers uh, as needed. So um that's kind of how how our operation set up. Just lease land, just uh some of these places that you lease are are just old school places. Um just ponds and creeks and then some of the guys are like the creek never dries up and then it comes to august 15th and everything's dry and it hasn't rained in six weeks and like yeah this creek does dry up so uh and the ponds are green so i've transitioned uh with some nrcs help uh probably five years ago to try to get some water troughs in so um water troughs it takes pipeline you know water pipelines water troughs and and as far as um that's kind of my operation so i've set up some water troughs and i've seen firsthand the cow nutrition increase and if you're if you're raising your own heifers you want them on clean water if you're trying to raise heifers on pond water it just it just has not went well uh and we've learned that through the years so um that's how my i've transitioned in from ponds to troughs as i can get maybe better places and maybe get a little bit of help uh, with NRCS, the EQIP program. So um, that's how my mine has transitioned and uh, and that's how kind of where we are on our water. So I've, I've put in a lot of pipelines uh, with NRCS help. So they've, uh, it's, it's great. It's been a good deal uh, for me uh, because how my lease places are set up, you know, I may not see the cattle every day. So I need something that's a little mm -hmm. bit, um, I try to do as much rotational grazing as I can, uh, but they're usually in a uh, more of a 20, 30, 40 acre field rotational grazing like that. So I haven't been able to squeeze them down real tight because I may not see them for three or four days. So how I have to make a round uh, and my hand has to make a round, how we have to travel. So uh, to travel 45 miles or so in a line through the parishes. So, you know, you don't always see the cattle every single day. So I need something that's really kind of takes a lot of the variables out of it, takes the problems out of it as best as possible. There's still stuff like just the challenge of keeping a float on, you know, if the float comes off and it's two days, you're going to have a big bill if you're just on a water system. So um, trying to eliminate as many variables as I can, uh, being on lease land, you know, so that's kind of, uh, some of mine. Um, but, uh, and then also the problems with the, with the troughs, uh, the permanent troughs that I put in, they just tend to, you know, there is going to be a spot, you know, where they're just loafing too close 
to the you know to the water so there, there's going to be within you know 300 foot it's going to get, start getting pretty wore down and if it's permanent i mean if it's an nrcs permanent trough it's it's permanent you know it's it's got a lifespan so you don't move it you just maintain it for 10 years so uh, there's no moving that one so they're setting up and as far as the nrcs i will say with my nrcs hat that they want to see uh the sediments and the erosion eliminated so when they set up uh a permanent water facility it's permanent so they they're going to put in use taxpayer money to put in a pipeline it's going to be to a certain spec it's going to be pressured uh pressure rated it's going to be they're going to come out and do a survey they're going to find you know they're going to get on the topo map they're going to find the elevations and they're going to be sizing your pipe to fit your elevations and then also the water system pressure and then how many cows per uh how many cows you have on the on that water system so it's going to be uh it's going to be they're going to size it for 12 gallons per head per day is what they say a cow drinks so that's what they're going to go after they're going to say uh so they're going to size that whole it's going to be a whole water system so um if you want you want me to go into that now the 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 price what it, what it takes to get a system put in i think let's let's move on to the next person first okay. and then good. come back to the pricing on that okay on the comparisons bob let's let's hear about your setup and what you have um so let's see yeah a little short history of what we do uh we raise grass fed and grass finished beef um uh, we graze uh in small paddocks uh we have about a hundred between it, de it depends on the season but 130 to close to 200 animals of different classes during a year uh i graze anywhere from half an acre to four acres at a time with you know multiple daily moves depending on the season in the winter time we may not move them for two days uh and but right now we're moving them several times a day uh we're trying to because we're trying to finish cattle um so uh so we started off I mean, we, we've had we've had cattle on the land for a really long time it's family land uh they were part of the uh rice farm when my dad was a kid and and uh we moved into into producing beef in the early 2000s uh i'd say uh we we started off with uh with only 80 acres we're, we're close we're about 200 acres now um we we started off with uh central water tanks and different pastures it was in our we did the nrcs program and uh and it worked pretty well for, at the time for what we did uh, the the lip it, it was it was kind of a limiting factor though because you can only split your paddocks up so much uh when you're trying to when you're trying to do graze how we graze it, it limits how you can move them around your paddock because you have to manage for your water uh i mean they don't have to drink every five minutes but if they you know you can they gain better if, if they can go get water whenever they want. Uh, so we took back some land out of uh, conventional agriculture back in 2011. Uh, and at first, we were just using garden hoses. Um, that turned into a nightmare. Hoses started breaking. And when you have to move 1,500 feet of garden hose to graze one sec from one side of the <gasps> acreage the other side of the acreage that's all day you know it just turned into a nightmare so i started doing some research and uh came up with the uh heavy duty polyethylene pipe it's uh i use one inch it's pretty pretty thick sidewalls you can see uh you can you can drive tractors over it uh i run it on top of the ground um you can I, i've driven I've driven a, a truck with a gooseneck full of tray full of hay over it. So I mean 20,000 wow. pounds, uh, no problem. 
Um, it's easy to install. Uh, so that was, that was something because I, I don't have a lot of help here. I have a guy that works for me uh, now. And at the time, I had another guy who is not nearly as mechanical as Joey, who works for me now. Um, and so I had to figure out how to get this in with, without digging trenches and stuff like that. Uh, I have the, uh, a couple of the fittings that I use. Um, this was the first fitting I used. It's called, it's a compression fitting. Uh, you basically unscrew this. You, uh, put that on there and, and you slide this back on there and you screw it down. Um, this is how I hook the troughs up to it. I just run a hundred foot garden hose or so off the, now I've actually moved to like the quarter turn valves because they don't break as much. The handles don't break as much as these. Um, but during, during pandemic times, these were impossible to find and they got about twice as expensive. They went from about $11 to about $25 each. Uh, so I found these other ones, which is, uh, made by a company called Watts. These are, these are made by, uh, Phil Mac, but now there's several other companies doing them. Gallagher, I think is starting to make them and a few other companies. Um, uh, these is same kind of same, similar concept. You push this on, there's a little, there's a little lip right here. You push it over the lip and you screw and you screw this down on there tight, uh, these are about ten dollars each, uh, so that's what I went with. Um, my my water system's a lot more mobile using this. I have a I have a a hook up every three hundred feet or so. Uh, I have over a mile of this pipe running down the middle of my farm and in a couple other paddocks, uh, and. Uh, so I have two water wells. I have one on the old part of the farm and one on the new part of the farm. And uh, it holds pressure uh, pretty good the whole way across. This is one inch pipe. You can get it in three quarter inch. You can get it in one and a half inch. I mean, depending on how far a run it is. I'm not a, I'm not a water pressure expert, so I don't know exactly. You know, I can't recommend a size pipe for a size farm, but, but I, I run, I have, I have one run that's at least a mile of this running off of a four inch well, and it holds pressure good. Uh, I use, we use a, about a 40 gallon trough uh, to water all my cows. It's easy to move because we move it so many times a day. Uh, because we do run in such small paddocks, uh, we, we're able to use a smaller trough like that. If you were like David and you're running in 20, 30, 40 acre paddocks, your cows tend to all go back to water at the same time instead of one after another intermittently during the day. So you would probably want to use a bigger trough and you probably wouldn't be as mobile. But uh, things that I like about it, um, it's easy to install. You don't have to trench. You don't have to uh, do anything like that. One person can install it. Two people is easier but uh it can be done by one person pretty easily uh the uh cons of it um if you live if i, I mean it doesn't get i mean about as far south louisiana as you can get uh so we don't get a whole lot of freezing temperatures um during during big freeze events i, I either leave the end of the line running or I'll drain the pipe uh, if I really had to. Like if the cows aren't going to be on that part of the farm, I'll cut the water off and drain the pipe. But I've never had a problem with it. it, it I mean, it's, it's plastic, it's flexible. So you never have a problem with it busting uh, if a little bit of water freezes in there. Now um, it can just affect your, uh, your water availability. Um, this past year, we actually, during the last big freeze, we actually drilled a small hole in the water trough and uh, let water flow out of the back of the trough. So water would constantly be moving through the system. So we didn't have to worry about the trough icing up. Um, I'm trying to think if I'm leaving anything out. Uh, I mean, it, it lets me, it lets, it lets me 
grays, uh, like I said, a lot more uniformly in paddocks. Uh, it's uh, and and it's easier to work with. Um, I guess that's about all I have on that topic. And and Bob, just to clarify, you're running that pipe on top of the ground. Yes, around? yes, it's on it's on top of the ground. Um, I have a I have a road. My, my farm is kind of L shaped, so I have a road that runs down the middle of the long part, and a road that runs up the middle of the other part. And I kind of run it right along fence lines or along my road. And uh, so I'm only I'm only about uh, probably two thousand feet wide. And so I'm able to run hoses uh, where I need to, if I need to go a little bit further. So I, I don't mm -hmm. have really long, uh, but, but yeah, it runs across the, the top of the ground. And what do you call that valve that you showed us? Um, this one is made by Watts. Uh, it's A-N-K-A, -A, I don't really, like Anka or something like that. Um, they, they make all different kinds. I mean, they make, they make teas like this. And I, I set it up the same way as this. I just put a PVC fitting and a hose bib in there and, uh, and uh, attach my trough to that. Uh, this is made by Filmac. Uh, it's a compression fitting. So this is just a screw on fitting and this is a compression fitting. Uh, but like I said, other companies are starting to make these now. Gallagher, I know is starting to make one and a few other companies. Uh, if you, you know, you can search them on the internet pretty easily, okay. HPE compression fittings. Awesome. Okay. Thank you, Bob. That's super helpful to see as well. Um, Rickson. Yep. Tell us about your operation kind of, and, and, and what, what we, you guys haven't touched on much is um, you, you guys. So Bob, you've been producing beef and cattle for quite a few years, right? Yeah, yeah, we've been doing, we finished our first grass-fed animal in 2005, and we were selling quarters and halves only until 2012, where I started doing retail cuts in addition to quarters and halves. Uh, and, and David, you've been a producer for how many years, you said? Uh, bought my own first cattle, probably 2017. Um, bought my first set of heifers then. So just working for LSU Ag Center as a beef cattle researcher up in the Hill Farm Research Station and then running a ranch operation and then decided to get in a little bit myself in 2017. So, mm -hmm. And then Rickson, I know you're going to tell us a little bit about your start. Yep. Yep. Let's see. I'll see if I can share the screen. All right. I know you started um, not long ago, right, Rickson? That's correct. Yep. You see that screen? It looks great. Yeah. Okay, y'all y'all see it? Okay. All right. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I was <laughs> I was in a totally different business. And uh, because of my health, I was looking at the food we're eating and I said, you know, we got to get cleaner food, better food, more nutritious food. And uh ended up at some workshops. Uh Soil Health Academy was the first. And, <laughs> and uh, I had sold my business and retired, so I had the time and went to different grazing workshops. Jim Gary's went to Joel's house, this place. I mean, I went all over the place. And then uh, after reading Rick, uh, Greg Cutie's book, No Risk Ranching, I said, you know, I think we can do that. Leach land and run cattle, That's I think that's something I can do. So my oldest son, he said, yeah, I think we can do that. So he has a full-time job. And uh, he helps me. He's my chief engineer. So uh, I guess in 2020, we leased a place not far from the house, about 35 miles away, and um, had a little bit of interior fencing in place. The guys that had leased it before me had done rotational grazing to some extent, but they were in the ponds. So uh, the first thing we did was, can y'all see the map? Yeah. Okay. These are the fields, if you can see my cursor, 26, 26, 23. That's how many acres are in the field. 
most of these dark interior lines are hot wires. There's a ditch right here. It's a deep ditch. Uh, and there's happened to be a concrete bridge across it right there. The previous the owner one time was owner of the was part owner of the concrete plant. So there's concrete all over the floor. Mm -hmm. These dark blotches are ponds. So a lot of ponds, but as I said earlier, I was told early on, keep your cows out of the lake. So we we, we uh, ran hot wire in all the lakes. And when we thought, okay, now how do we get the water? Uh, so, you know, the options are uh, paved ramps, which I said, okay, or gravel ramps. I thought, well, we're leasing this farm. We can't carry that with us. Everything we did, we wanted to be somewhat temporary. So if we needed to, we could move it with us. So these dark green circles are water troughs, 300 gallon rubber made water troughs. We, over a period of three years, we've slowly established these. This black, these red lines, those are, as you said, HDPE, high density polyethylene pipe, so that we can transport water from here. We got a water tank, water tank, water tank this side of the creek, water tank. So now all the cattle can access all these areas. We got a gate right here so they can come in there. <clears throat> these are all downhill so we can gravity flow once we get the water over the pond. This one's about a 1200 foot run from there to here and we're crossing a, a pretty good sized creek. So same thing here, come to this field here and then we got water down here Previous grazers never accessed this field because they didn't have any water. So we're kind of excited about being able to move cows with water. So, all right, let's see if I can. Yeah, let's see if I can. All right. Let's see if I. There we go. All right. So uh, we don't have any wells. Uh, we don't have access to the municipal water supply. So everything's on water. And as I said a minute ago, uh, we wanted water from the ponds, but we didn't want the cows in the ponds. So they're not allowed to access the ponds. You can see a little hot wire right here going around this pond. So we had to have a way to draw water from the ponds to stock tanks. Our options were to limit access with stone covered ramps. Well, we didn't want to do that because we couldn't take it with us. So we gravity flow water to stock tanks. And then we grab it up. We, put, uh, we tried initially to gravity flow over the levees. And that worked, but it took two of us to get the system primed. Once it was primed, it would work. It seems like when we needed it most in the middle of the summer or the middle of the winter, we'd lose a prime. And then we had a problem. So then the other option was to figure out a way to pump water into a, we call it a nurse tank, stock tank upstream from the pond and then flow from that tank downstream into other tanks. Uh, Gravity flow was. Rickson, are you are you on your PowerPoint yet? I'm just. Yes. Checking. Oh, y'all are. Think you're seeing that. Okay. okay. So if you'll stop sharing your screen, and then you'll have to do it again now that the PowerPoint's open, that'll be the easiest way to transition. All right. Oh uh, yeah. Okay. Let's try that. I'm sorry. No problem. It's all good. Uh. Well, let's see. Should be. Well. <clears throat> well. All right. Let me try it again. That didn't work. All right. Do you see that? No. Oh, well, did I lose y'all all? Are y'all still there? No, we can see you just fine. 
You may just have to push the uh, share screen one more time. I've lost. Uh, I've lost your box. You see the Zoom icon at the there bottom. There we go. There we go. Okay. Perfect. All right. Let's see if I can. <laughs> I thought I was doing pretty good. Well, you're doing great. David, um, NRCS must have liked you so much. There it goes. They hired, they hired oh, there you, you go. You see it now? Looks yeah, great. That's great. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right. Y'all did see the map though, right? Oh, yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So here we go. Oh, anyway. So we're back to, we finally came to the conclusion that a little portable water tank, if we could pump it in a water tank, gas could access the tank. And then we said, well, if we've got it on top of a levee with water in it, now we can gravity flow out and we can control the water by uh, keeping that tank full. So it was pretty transportable. We could pull it with a four wheeler anywhere we needed to go. Simple to set up, relatively inexpensive. And we used it as a nurse tank to get water to other tanks. So the pieces involved, the stock tank, in our case, we used 150 gallon rubber made tank. And I think there's some prices over here. I can't see because it. Yeah, we can see. Yeah, okay. Prices. Uh, so uh, wood sled, we just built that out of uh, four by fours and then two by six runners. 12 volt bills pump, just a bills pump for a boat. In our case, we used a 1500 gallon per hour, which is way over capacity for what we need. A float switch, and I'll show some individual pictures later of what they are. A float switch to, uh, that cuts the water flow on and off on demand. We used RV deep cycle marine batteries. Uh, we got tired of batteries running down. So we got, expensive batteries, solar panels and controllers so that we don't have to worry about batteries being dead. Uh, whenever we need them, they're hot. And then we use a little clear hose for our suction line. Okay, here's our little battery box with a C in there. There's a little 12 volt toggle switch right there. That's how I turn it on and off. So the, uh, and we keep the battery protected in a box to keep the ants and rodents and everything else out of it. There's our little 12 volt bills pump. We put the pump inside of a five gallon plastic bucket with holes drilled in it because turtles were eating the wires. <laughs> and uh, we run the wire inside our suction line all the way up to the tank. Same thing, turtles were eating a hole. They were eating those wires. They didn't eat the suction line, but they'd eat the wires. So we got a 35 foot piece of uh, inch and a half clear suction line. And we just throw it in the pond. And when we get finished, we pull it back out. Uh, there's a bottom, top and a bottom on the bucket, with hole drill in it and, and the hose runs out of the bucket. You'll see it in a minute. Uh, this is critical. <laughs> That's a float switch. Uh, the first float switch we used was on a, uh, came with the pump. It was a little bilge pump, which that really was meant to be in the bottom of a boat. But we had a hard freeze and it froze the switch and busted it. So, well, we got to do something different. This is a sump pump float switch. They're about 20 bucks. You can buy them at Lowe's, Home Depot. And when the water drains down, that float switch drops, it'll release a little steel ball that makes a magnetic circuit inside and it'll make a circuit, cut the pump on. When it raises up, it flows to the top, cuts the circuit, cuts it off. Real simple, very effective. Uh, that one's worked for three years. So they're very effective. Um, there, That's a solar uh, charger charge controller uh, we use 100 watt solar panels. The first panels we used, uh, we, we mounted these controllers on there so that they wouldn't overcharge the batteries and burn the batteries up. Most of the uh, solar panels now, they've got trickle chargers built in so that they will not overcharge. 
but all that goes in that box. And there's my little 12 volt switch. So that's that's the system right there. That's my own off switch. Uh, we can turn the pump, we can turn the tank off in, in wintertime. You mentioned freezing, we're a little bit further north. If it's not gonna be a hard freeze, we very rarely, rarely turn anything off because the water in the suction line drains back to the pump in the lake. So there's no water in the suction line. If it's gonna freeze, get down in the teens, we can drain the tank. And the next morning we can go put the plug in it, flip the switch, turn it on, fill it right back up. The HDPE pipe just sits on top of the ground. As you said, it won't burst. If it freezes, it won't burst. And as long as you use those HDPE fittings, they're okay. But if you put brass fittings in, they can freeze. And we got real sophisticated and we <laughs> we buy some bags of bark mulch or potting soil, whichever is the cheapest thing we can buy from Lowe's or Home Depot. And we just set them on top of the valves. So they're, they're covered by five a gallon of you know, whatever bag of whatever and uh, keeps the valves from freezing. And where the connection goes to the water tanks, we use a uh, quick connect. I'll show you in a minute. Uh, we use quick connect so that we can make the, uh, well, the water lines are permanent. We just got a quick connect laying in different places and we can hook right up to the tank. I'll show you. Uh, there's one, there's a quick connect. Uh, Camlock quick connect, if y'all don't use them, boy, they're, they're so quick and easy. And every hose, every hose has, we finally got everything standard. Everything's inch and a half. Male fittings on the water tanks, female on all the hoses to connect. So anywhere we go, we got the same fittings. We don't have to worry about what to hook up. Uh, occasionally we've used mineral water or if we want some more water hit a site besides the tank, uh, we just unhook the quick connect, take the hose, fill up whatever else we want. We, in this case, we just put water in there, put a little sea salt mineral, and we're ready to go real quick, real simple. Uh, we finally got smart and said, if we're going to take these and put them on top of a pond dam, we get higher elevation, a lot better flow rate. I think it's 2.3 gallons of pressure for every one foot of elevation. And this has been a game changer in one sense. We've got two portable carts that we can pull around, but it's just me. Now we've got four pond dams that we've got a tank sitting there permanently. So all I do is come up and, uh, well, I, I, we just leave everything hooked up and uh, I can flip the switch on and off. That's been, that's been nice. Um, we hot wire around all of our stock tanks to keep the cows out of them. They got to learn to be ladies and share, and we don't want them stepping on or breaking our connections. Uh, that was not even hot. That's out in the middle of the field. I don't even have. And uh, I had just moved them in. just hadn't even gotten the tank filled up yet. But there they are with the hot wire across to keep them from fighting and uh, all at one time. So, all right, I'm going to any questions? Let me go grab another one here with some more pictures. Simple, but there's my batteries. So just a different location. Now you see where I got my little bucket out there. It's not even totally submerged. Uh, and I hook up, there's a chain on the front. Rickson, I think we're still on the PowerPoint at this point. Uh, we have to kind of transition between the PowerPoint and the photos themselves. Okay. I got to do this again. That was a great PowerPoint, though, to show a yeah. lot of detail. Yeah, it was really interesting. Yes. Anybody have questions for Rickson while he's going in between? Can you see it now? Not quite yet. All right, now how do I do this? So when you click share screen, instead of clicking the one that shows just the image that you're looking at, there might be another one next to it that shows all of your computer. I've and lost, well, I've lost where y'all are. Uh, okay, back to the Zoom. Okay, there we go. It happens to me all the time. All right. Let's see here. 
share screen. And it might say share desktop. If you click that one, then we can see anything right. that you click to. Oh, can perfect. You see, can you see it now? Mm -hmm. All right. Well, no, I, uh, or while I'm fumbling around, y'all got any questions? And I'll, I can't, what I'm looking for. Oh, let's try it right there. All right. All right. Can you see that? Yep. Okay. There we go. There's my little cart. I'm just showing, I just move it around, hook it up to a four wheeler, pull it around. Uh, yeah, real sophisticated on top. We just drill a hole in a two by four and got this attached to the top and we stick our hose right through there. We figured out if you run the hose too deep in there, it would siphon it back. Cut off, if, if it, it, it would suck the water back out of the tank. So we just stick it up on Little battery box. It's just bolted to the bottom. Uh, there's my little, there's my switch. That's a fuse. A little solar panel. Pop wire across the top. There's a little pump. There's a good close up of the quick connect. Uh, there's a valve. That's what I put a little bag of anything on top during really cold weather just to keep that valve from freezing. And another location. Now we've got a uh, uh, ICB tote there now. Y'all use quick connects, those cam locks? I, I don't, but it's, it's not a bad idea. Oh, they are nice. They're so quick. They don't have to screw anything in, they're tight. There's a valve teeing off to another tank. I think that's it. I was wondering, Rickson, would a filtering type system work on yours at all? A to filter? Mm -hmm. To filter that pond water? Um, I don't know. If I, if I could figure out how to do it. You know, three of the lakes, three of the ponds are really clear. We got one that is really bad. I try not to put cows in pastures where we had to pull water out of because it is, it, it is bad to grow algae. We get a lot of philomonas algae and I've not figured out how to clean it up. And I know that, I know that water's not as good as it needs to be. So I'm open for that. Yeah, so it, it sounds like it's a pretty good time for us to kind of talk about, are you, are you finished with your worst Yeah, that's you it. Talk about, so yeah. let's, let's do some comparison here. Um, as far as cleanliness goes, you know, what, what are you doing to keep your systems clean? I mean, I'll every day before I go into an if, if I'm going into a new paddock, because uh, I move them every day, sometimes two or three times a day. I'll I'll dump I'll empty that tank. I, there's a valve at the quick connect. I'll cut it off. I'll drain the tank. I'll take a little uh, scrub brush, clean the tank out, and start new water. I clean the tanks every day. And then I've, I've, this time of year, as the algae gets to blooming, um, it's in some of the pictures, but I didn't point it out. I just got a little bottle in there with holes cut in it and a three inch chlorine tablet that mm -hmm. I put in the tanks, in the troughs. There's a chlorine tablet in there to help take care of some of that algae. It's not the best solution, but it's better than nothing. And I think that's what um, Wedge Barth is using on his more permanent troughs, kind of like David's. David, do you have a solution for cleanliness on yours that you're using? I don't have a solution um, completely. It's just, just, you need to clean them at least once a year or so, and um, just kind of keep them clean, you know, as best you can. You know, if you had a way to pump, it, pump them dry. I've, I've even got some troughs that are concrete, permanent, built on site, you know, framed up, rebar in them and everything on a concrete pad. So those do not have a bottom spigot. There's no draining them really of any way. 
So it's just brushing them out, try to rinse them out with a, you know, rinse them out, scoop it out literally, and just let it, let it dilute it back out. So it's uh, those permanent ones, even the permanent ones that are, that are metal that you can manhandle, they're, you know, they're eight foot round. So uh, that's still a, it's quite a bit of effort to drain them. You know, you can't always just uh, let them drink it down dry. Yeah, certain times of year you wouldn't do that. But so no, there's not, you know, the, the chlorine tablets is probably one of the better ways to try to keep it clean, you know. So I, I will say back when I used to use the big bigger stationary troughs, uh we used to put goldfish in them. Mm -hmm. Um that worked really well. And we used we used old tires. And so if you have big open troughs, it doesn't work as good because sometimes birds will come in and eat the goldfish. <laughs> but, the, but the goldfish could hide under the rim of the tire. And so we didn't have to worry about, oh, about birds eating the goldfish. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, yeah, I meant, I meant to save this on my – I took a picture of my trough yesterday, and I meant to set, save it on my computer, but I can, I can show on my phone. Uh, yeah. That's one of my trough setups, and it's so small, and we empty it so much. You see a little bit of – algae on the bottom right there but it never really gets uh mm. it never really gets full up with algae because we we empty it so much uh when we move it um and the little valve i use this is just the one that they sell at my local feed stores extra flow but it's like the the joe mm. valve i mean they're all the same it's it's a little float that sits at the bottom of your, at your trough and that little balloon thing is what cuts on and off the water when it gets it's a lot like the float switch that uh rickson uses except it's a uh, manual not automatic yeah. the, uh I, and i forgot to point it out probably the one of the most important pieces is in a in a downstream tank at the actual stock tank we had a hard time finding a valve because we were gravity flow when we first gravity flow over the dike over the dam the flow was so low we tried all the joe valves made and we didn't have enough pressure well there's a valve i think it made by roberts it's a brass valve they're not cheap they're like 80 bucks a piece but they will take any low flow or some of our pressures up to like 40 pounds of pressure gravity fed uh and we just uh, we put a uh, I put a milk carton on it. It floats to the top, so that we okay. We got a demand at the top where we're filling up the feed water, and then a demand at the bottom when when the cows drink out of it. They have a different float, okay? Because when when they drink it down, it's got to open up the valve upstream, and let it down. So we have two valves, and the, that brass valve is underwater, so it never freezes. Uh, but it is critical, and it's it's a Roberts gas valve. Uh, some of them are – we've got some that are one inch. Uh, our big pipe now is inch and a half running across the creek, and uh, we've got an inch and a half water valve. It'll fill up that 300-gallon tank in, I don't know, 10, 15 minutes, and they can't drink it down. When we got the hot wire across the top, they can't drink it down. Valve is critical. Without that valve, we couldn't do it. Well, let's kind of move into some some price comparisons before we run out of time. Maybe let's start, David. I know you had yours kind of ready to go as far as pricing. Um, and Rickson, you laid yours out a little bit. I would love to kind of compare maybe some totals. Um, um, you know, trying to compare as best we can compare apples to apples. Give us an idea. Give us an idea of about how many head you're watering, and maybe how much it might cost you to water that many head with your setup. Assuming a water source, whether that's Rickson's ponds or a spigot somewhere. Assuming you have a water source, what's your cost of getting that system to a rotational grazing type system? Who's going first? I think David and I think yep. David muted if I'm not okay. mistaken. That's right. Okay. All right. We'll we'll give it a shot. So say we're uh, say we're at a 75 mama cows and we're 
around 12 gallons per head per day. And we're just going to kind of set them and forget them kind of like I do. You know, we're going to, we're going to set them out. We're going to turn the water on. They're going to have enough for two days. Cause you know, I'm not going to see them for two or three, four days. So, so I'm going to need enough storage. So my, how I'm set up, I need enough storage in case something happens and something blows out downstream. They need to have enough water for two days at least before I see them again, uh, for example. So I would need to set up at least probably really more like three troughs, but I'm going to just say two troughs for 75 head. And, uh, and that would run me – uh say i went down to tractor supply and bought 800 gallon uh or 752 gallon eight foot trough uh it would run me about 1300 bucks so uh if i'm going to set it up uh like nrcs spec type if we're going to talk about that i would need to put a rock pad under it which would run me uh right now locally with rock and everything, it would run me about twelve hundred bucks to put rock under one trough, so it'd run me twenty three hundred bucks. So two troughs, two rock pads. Uh, if I if I knew the guys local, the the dump truck drivers, and I did it myself, it would probably cost me about thirty five hundred bucks just to set two troughs uh, with local pricing. Um, that's just me, you know. That's me buying it. Uh, that's what it would cost me for two permanent rock pads and and eight foot troughs, just for two. So they'd probably cost me thirty five hundred bucks to put it in if my water is sitting there. You know, if I have a pipeline sitting there with a spigot up. So now if I have to run a pipeline, um, some of that PVC pipe has doubled um, from twenty nineteen. Mm -hmm. to today some of that pvc pipe is double in price um where i was paying 40 cents i'm paying uh actually i pay actually it was a dollar 20 a foot for pvc pipe and uh that was actually gas pipe pricing so <laughs> i could have put in gas pipe for the same price as one inch pvc pipe and uh because i was buying gas pipe for a welding job and i was pricing pvc and it was the same price, one inch gas pipe and um, actually one and a half inch gas pipe and one inch PVC pipe are the same price. So um, just that, you know, when things go way inflated like this, uh, it costs a lot to put in some permanent facilities. And uh, it's going to be a while. Uh, it's going to be a while to pay that off. So, uh, but anyways, just two troughs, two rock pads, if that's kind of how we want to compare it, maybe for 75 mama cows. Um, so uh, let me know if you need like some other pricing, like maybe what NRCS pays for something like this. If you yeah, yeah go, let's go ahead and add in. So, the so, stuff so well. if you was just a, just a regular producer, not a underserved producer, um, the, uh, let me see real right here. So like a water facility, uh, they, they're they shooting it per gallon. So they're at $2, say they're at, uh, they're at $2 and 32 cents. So they're paying 17.44 for a, a eight foot round water trough. So, um, so two troughs, um, they, they would pay 17.44 times two, it's just 3,500 bucks to put two troughs in and then their cost share is also on a rock pad uh 2256 so they would pay 5740 on cost share um on that same thing i just paid 3500 bucks to go put in so with that you just have to think you know this is a permanent facility they're putting in so they uh they're they're uh it's got to be to a lot of specs that if I was paying out of pocket, having to put something like this together, I don't always put eight inches of rock down. I may, I may would put in just enough to get by and I wouldn't put eight inches down. But if you're using any kind of cost share and you have a contract, then they have these specs that they want to make sure it's there for the lifespan. So they have the lifespans and specs and it's got to, they can come back 10 years later 
on some of this stuff and check it if they I guess if they needed to because they pay for it so uh you got to meet this meet the lifespan on these practices so um you think that they pay kind of they pay a good bit of it but it's got you got to be able to maintain it for all that lifespan of that practice so that's where uh that's where it kind of comes down to so and what you is, what is the approximate lifespan david how how uh, the water troughs are 10 years i believe the water troughs are 10 years and so is the rock pads are 10 years what so, kind of trough is that is that a metal trough that's a metal trough i'm just talking about a metal trough right now just because that's kind of what i usually buy uh they do concrete troughs tire troughs and metal troughs that i know of right in this area like people in milo area that's kind of what we do uh they, some folks do some concrete and then the tires and then the then in the middle so there's, there's a gal there's a gallon price for all these different troughs so it's a different gallon price uh the cost share price that they pay so and that is through the nrcs equip program that's, that's nrcs equip so that's an RCS equip program call share. So did I hear you correctly saying that that's fifty seven forty that they would call share on it, but it only cost you thirty seven fifty. Thirty four eighty, I guess, is the general, and that's that's uh very well, rough, I'm sure. Yeah, that's just some rough general prices. What I've paid locally uh, in the last couple last year, I've literally paid for troughs, and I have bought forty dollars a ton for rock. Um, so that's what I've paid lately, uh, which is more than it was, but it's, uh, that's what it is. So, and so that's actually making you some money in that sense, uh, not in a sense but in a sense, you're, you're not out of pocket yeah. anything really. What, yeah. If you're doing your own labor basically. Yeah. There's no labor in this. And, uh, and this is to keep it up for 10 years. So you got to put that because your trough may get destroyed you know in two years okay you need to replace your trough and you need to fix your rock pad and uh i've seen them held, hold up for a long time but you still have to maintain these practices so um i guess you could say make a little but uh it's just a cost share so when things go really high inflation wise you know there's you know you still got a pipeline so that's kind of what it is that's the that's the 2023 prices so um but it's permanent so yeah mm -hmm. and and i know you mentioned that um nrcs can come out and check that practice but can you delve into that a little bit more i know that's one of the fears that people have with nrcs yeah uh, it, it the lifespans are supposed to how i understand it from just being here two years is the lifespans are supposed to uh i mean they're pay they're spending taxpayer money for this so they don't want to see neglect and they don't want to see uh i guess uh people trying to i guess play the system i guess I, you know that's how i look at it from just being outside the world like people possibly doing practices thinking they're going to make a couple bucks and then destroy the practice and put something else in there you know you know what i mean so they they have a lifespan to where this thing's supposed to hold up uh so it's a lot of the stuff's pretty bit it's built and engineered so um so there we can go back out there and check it um and and see if you've destroyed it uh and you have to pay that money back you know they could they can mm. come back here for collections so it's so rare i'm sure that i mean if you have something that's really working well for you yeah you wouldn't want to destroy it yeah yeah, yeah. All right Bob, tell us about your cost comparisons as we're finishing up the webinar. All right. Um, my internet is being a little weird, so if I cut out for some reason, just let me know, and I'll go back to where I – tell me where I stopped, and uh, oh, I think it just cut out. Are you good? We hear you. Oh, well, we did. <laughs> Gotta love that rural internet. <laughs> okay okay wait i think i'm back yes okay um so a 40 a 45 gallon trough at tractor supply i just looked on 
online the other day is, is 60 bucks. Uh, the one inch pipe that I use is 65 cents a foot um, from where I've been buying it from. Uh, obviously, if you needed a smaller, a shorter run, a three quarter inch pipe would work. If you need a longer run, uh, one and a half or one and a quarter inch pipe, I, I've been running off of a four inch well uh, that flows about between 50 and 60 uh, PSI. Um, so that all varies, you know, like, like David was saying, it varies on what your water source is and all that. Uh, my, my connections to connect the pipe vary, just say between seven and $15 each, depending on what, if it's a T or if it's straight connection, whatever. Um, in my, in my, I use $15 in my comparison, I, I used I did a thousand a thousand feet of pipe just because that's a good even number. Um and so uh the PVC connections to connect it to the well, thirty to forty dollars. Uh a a hundred foot hose to connect it to the water trough, about fifty bucks. So uh for a thousand feet is roughly about eight eight hundred and ninety to nine hundred bucks worth of materials uh to put it together um that's not including labor but like i said it goes together pretty easily you can do a thousand feet in a couple hours uh that's before it comes in rolls so you kind of have to unroll it the day before to let it kind of relax before you before you do it but uh but but it's about about 90 cents about 90 cents a foot is what i figured out uh if you buy the 300 foot rolls or the one inch it's a little bit cheaper than if you buy 100 foot rolls um the uh and 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 if you're i mean if you're only doing one water connection then your price look drops a little bit you know if you're only doing one trough all the way at the end of it it's a lot cheaper because you can buy the 300 foot rolls and less connections. And uh, so, but, but about 90 cents to a dollar per foot. Uh, I know NRCS doesn't support above ground water facilities. So it is all out of pocket costs, um, which is, which is a con and a pro in a way. I mean, NRCS has a certain way that you have to do it. And so, and for it's, based on that's the way their engineers said and and it's understandable because uh you know they want it to they want their money to last that they've cost shared with you so i understand why they do that because it has to be engineered a certain way but it it, it reduces the flexibility of what you're able to do so if you have if you have the money to pay out of pocket uh then it it's worth it but it, you know it's it's kind of a a decision you have to make on your own uh what works best for you and it sounds like timing is also a factor here because of the the equip program does take some time for application approval david what's kind of the turnaround on that if you know you need water you know to to add some paddocks like rickson did you know you need that what's kind of your time turnaround from the time you apply to potentially getting funding to start your project uh, well, there's a there's a first round cutoff day in November, uh, usually right around uh, right before Thanksgiving. So that's your first round cutoff, and they have ranking pools, and um, say everything just line up for you. You put an application in, uh, you know, in October, midsummer, you got into the first round rankings, and say everything just lined up for you. You met a lot of resource concerns, and you got into a contract. The contract will be signed in April, you know, May at the late, you know, towards the latest end. So you'd be in a contract by May. Uh, of course, that's just like you just went right through the system and nobody was in your way or nothing like that. But in, uh, in and you, you met all the criteria and such. So, you know, best case I've ever seen somebody put an application in and got a contract in May and they could start their, their practices. So. So about six months to make some permanent troughs. Yeah, it could possibly, you know, at, at best case scenario ever. Uh, but 
some people stay in you know the application stage for a couple of years so so if your cows need water today then you got to just do what you got to do and i've done that right. too you put in application then you just have to do what you have to do for your cattle so in your operation and then you get around to it and maybe you didn't need it after after all so they they think of that's how they've explained to me is if you can do it without their help then you maybe you didn't need their cost share help so that's how somebody's explained it to me he said hey if you needed it that bad and you had to do it then you didn't need government help i guess cost share to do it uh, so that's how they explained it to me a long time ago and i was like well I need it now and I'll have to find a way creatively to pay for it and make it happen if I need it that bad. So, uh, you know, it sounds like there's a lot of creativity and, you know, making things happen, you know, it, you know, cattlemen are really creative people. So you, you kind of like Rickson and, and, uh, and Bobby they're real creative, they figure out a way to make it happen, uh, to graze like they want to graze creatively. And that's a great thing. You know, if you can do it, that's that's amazing. So some of the things people come up with and invent is uh is really interesting to hear. So <laughs> yeah, very interesting. Yeah, um, and, and I will add one thing. Just uh, again, I'll reiterate the fact that I do use a small trough because I run cattle in such small paddocks, half an acre to four acres. Uh, if I was running 20, 30, 40 acres at a time. I would use a bigger trough so the cost would go up some uh, and they, they wouldn't be as mobile. I would need to own more troughs than just one. Uh, so that would increase your costs. It's, you know, it's because of the way I graze, I can, I can keep my, some of my costs down that way. Uh, so I just wanted to, anybody who came in a little bit later who didn't hear me say that earlier, I wanted to say that again, just because, Yeah, and and David, your system is pretty ideal for you being able to be gone like that because, like you had told me, you have you know you have one water system go out mm -hmm. if it was a temporary system, and your cattle go without water for the three days that you didn't go out to your lease and check them two or three days without water is can be deadly. So especially this time of year. Mm -hmm. Richard, did you have cost comparison on yours? Well, <laughs> I don't know how to do a cost a cost comparison. I but I just set it up. We got 14 permanent troughs. We got four temporary. That's 18 locations, 216 acres. That's every 12 acres we've got a water trough. So I move the cows every day, sometimes two and three times a day. Uh, we've had up to 100. Uh, the largest herd was, well, we, got, we actually got two herds out there right now over 100 cows and it just enables me to do it the expense is that hdpe pipe because gravity flow we need a bigger pipe because of the restriction we don't have well say that with the totes that's not true because we figured out we can take two totes the bottom tote more elevation we get more pressure so if you get 30 or 40 pounds of pressure, that's as much as a lot of the municipal water systems. So, you know, we, we started out with a bigger pipe. That's expensive. That HDPE pipe at an inch and a half is expensive. But I'm making, uh, well, two runs that are in all about 1,200 foot each. So that's a lot of, a lot of run. I just, you know, I don't know how to figure that because I got so many of those water stations. It's just a little... It's a little different. Our, our our little cart that we move around, I'm gonna say anywhere from three three hundred bucks up to we probably got close to a thousand dollars in them because we got uh, uh, better solar panels, better batteries, all that type of thing. Could we could we do it for less? Yes. But my son and I are both old school. If we're gonna do it, we want to do it one time, and we don't want to go back by putting in some cheap materials. We got those two temporary carts that we pull around. Now the now the more permanent on the totes that we figured out to stack them so we can get more water pressure. Uh, something nobody's mentioned. Uh, early on, we had a uh, we used a barn owl barn owl camera 
at a water trough till we got to where we would trust them that they would run all the time. We put that barn owl out there so that we, we knew we were getting water. Since I'm out there every day anyway, uh, I, I can check the water. It is, I think there's only been like maybe one time the water wasn't working when it was supposed to. It's been very reliable. So I'm not sure if that's answering your question. I'm just using plain old Rubbermaid tanks that I buy up at, at, at uh, Lowe's or uh, Tractor Supply. Metal might be a better option. I wanted something initially. We started out with one tank and I'd move it. We had a little small trailer and I'd, I'd move my cart. And if I had a downstream hose, I would move. I would move the water troughs as I went. And I'm old enough. I said, I'm tired of moving these tanks. So I'd rather spend the money and buy more tanks. So I'm, I move cows, not water. When I finally figured out that was an easier way to go, did it cost me some money yet? Look, we had no background in cattle at all three years ago. Never been around cows. But I figured I could grow grass. So the the question was, let's figure out how to go grass and we'll learn how to raise cattle. If you give them good grass, good water, we can grow cattle. So it's been a learning curve. Um, but I think we've from where we started, I think we've come a long way. Do what I see you on there. You could, you could verify three years ago. I didn't know what I was doing. I still, still don't know a lot, but I know I've, I made a lot of mistakes. I know what not to do. <laughs> anyway, we, I think we got our water worked out for our location. We got, we got it figured out. <clears throat> don't know if that's answered you wanted, but that's what. She I think it's wonderful. I think that um, you said 300 to 1,000, depending on how expensive you go with your parts and how long yeah. you want to last for those over the pond levy kind of systems, yeah. movable systems. And you guys have laid out three really great systems. I think all three are valuable in context. Whenever everybody asks one of these answers of what works for this situation, more often than not, you hear the, the answer, it depends. And I think you guys have all three really laid out a great example of it depends. It depends on what you have available. It depends on how often you're moving, what the size of your paddocks are, how much time you have. A lot of a lot of factors go into this. So we we uh, you guys have done a fabulous job of showing us what you do. Do any of our participants have any questions? And then we have a drawing that Bethany is going to do for two door prizes. I'm gonna make a comment too. If, if if we were to leave this lease next year, we can take everything with us. And it sounds like that H that pipe. I can't remember the name of that. HDP. Yes. Thank you. It sounds like the pipe, even though that Bob is using on top of the ground, could also be grabbed and moved. Am I wrong on that? Yes. Yes. Um, I I had run one the other day. When we initially put it in, we had to follow the contour of the, of the land because we didn't have enough pressure. Well, because we're using the ICB totes now, we got plenty of pressure. So we were we were uh, direct seeding, no-till seeding, uh, some summer grasses. <laughs> and I thought I had a direct line of sight where my line was, and it wasn't. And I cut that pipe in three places. But I had another pipe that we were trying to the, – the owner has some well water out there, but they won't let us use it. So I had another piece of pipe somewhere else. So I just pulled the pipe over, hooked it up in less than an hour. I'd run another 300 feet of pipe because I had the pipe there. So that's how quick and simple it is. So yeah, I can just pull it up and move it to wherever I want if I had to. Any other questions from any of our other people or comments? Good deal. I think Stuart mentioned on the comments, we had one comment in the chat about putting just minnows even from your ditch in there for cleanliness. Just just pull, scoop a few fish out of your little pond or whatever and put them in your thing. And Stuart had told me a long time ago that a lot of people used to cover their water troughs with a little shelter in order to keep the sunlight from getting in there and keeping the algae down. And um. We, we personally have had pretty good results with plants in a couple of our water troughs, but also keeping our water troughs smaller 
so that they cycle through faster. It's something I learned from keeping an aquarium is plants and cycling the water through quickly keeps a really clean water trough easier than a, than larger and sitting there for longer. But you do run the risk of during a hurricane or anything like that, you know, that that quick cycling, you can get in a bind if you don't have your electricity or your something, you know, your source can get messed up. Bethany, I think you're up to do our drawing. Okay, is the screen sharing on for me? Yes. Hold on. Mm. Bethany is our intern uh, at Louisiana Grazing Lands, and she's been doing a really good job of sending the emails and creating the graphics and helping us get the word out about all of our events. While she's working on that, we do have a webinar next week. It's going to be from Noble Research Institute. Jim Johnson is going to be telling us about their new program. They're having a hmm, sustainable agriculture systems um, essentials course that they're introducing that's new to them. And then we also have a pasture walk uh, in conjunction. We're not doing this pasture walk, but Southern University is hosting it this um friday and it's in deritter and then on the 25th we have another um, i'm sorry july 25th on a tuesday evening we have a pasture walk at wedge barths so please join us for more webinars and more pasture walks this summer and our bus trip is still open for families as well wonderful okay i'm gonna spin it and we're doing two, so this is the first one for the t-shirt. I don't know why it's lagging. Okay, that's for number one. All right, congrats, Mark. Is it really slow on y'all's end, too? Yeah. That's cool. I don't know what to do. Okay, let's just try to. Mm -hmm. We just really are meant to take in all that confetti. <laughs> <laughs> Savor it. Okay. Oops. Someone stole LSU's internet again. That's what it is, Bethany. That's what it is. And this is for the pliers, or yeah. So. Yeah. Okay. Ellen, do you have any closing remarks? No, I just want to thank all of our guests for being here today. Like Stuart said, this was a great look into three different types of operations. And I think that there was a lot of valuable information on here. So thank you all so much for taking time out of your, I know, busy schedules to give some knowledge to all of us on this call, as well as on YouTube. Um, and again, this is recorded. So we're going to put this up on our YouTube and you'll get the link sent out to you. Um, so if you wanna share this with anyone else, if you enjoyed what you saw, please definitely pass that along. All right. With that, thank, thank you. you so much and enjoy your afternoon. Thank yeah, you. thanks for having us. Thank you. Thank you everyone.